was born and reared in Lincoln Town Well, Stretton is my name And if you'll listen to my tale I'll tell you of my shame For the memories of my home so dear They're all to no avail For I am the transportation To the shores of New South Wales Imagine a land with little fertile soil, few navigable rivers, potentially hostile locals, unfamiliar wildlife, much of which is quite dangerous, and this land is located at the furthest imaginable distance. And then imagine deciding to build a whole new country in this seemingly unwelcome location. I am, of course, referring to Australia as viewed from 18th century England. I want to share with you the remarkable story of the beginning of Australia's history as a Western nation, the birth of Australia. To say the birth of a nation, you can mean many things. It could mean when the dominant or founding ethnic group arrived, or it could mean when the modern incarnation of that state was born in a political and legal sense. Take the United States, for example. They commemorate both of these. At Thanksgiving, they remember the arrival of the English at Plymouth Rock, the people who would ultimately be instrumental in spreading their culture and creating the American nation. And they also commemorate Independence Day, when the modern state we call the USA was born. So they have a holiday for the arrival of the founding stock, and they have another for the birth of the modern state. Australia commemorates the former of these, that is the arrival of permanent British settlers in the territory making up their independent nation. Australia Day, the 26th of January, is when just over a thousand British sailors, convicts and marines arrived in Sydney Cove, Port Jackson, now the site of the city of Sydney. Thus began the remarkably successful process of creating a transplanted western country in the South Seas. Just as with Thanksgiving, the commemoration of the arrival of Europeans has become increasingly controversial. The significance and meaning of the dates have been attacked in both the US and Australia. This is indeed a trend throughout the English-speaking world where so-called decolonization has been brought home to the colonizers. I hope by the end of this video, it will be clear that the historical story of Australia's founding is one worth telling, worth remembering, and worth honoring. If you enjoy content about history, literature, and politics, do me a favor, like and subscribe. I'm publishing new content regularly. Anyway, for the moment, let's get back to New South Wales. Let's consider for a moment why the British government would undertake such a seemingly bizarre plan as sending significant numbers of people to live in the Antipodes. In fact, they had a bunch of reasons for doing so. First of all, and most famously, they needed somewhere to put their convicts. The traditional dumping ground for British criminals was America, but just five years before the departure of the first fleet of convict settlers for Australia, the American War of Independence came to an unsuccessful conclusion for Britain. Many convicts had since been sitting in prison ships off the coast of England, costing the British taxpayer money. Given the significance of penal life to the beginning of Australia, it is worth reflecting for a moment how different was the 18th century idea of dealing with convicts compared with today. Britain then did not run prisons as we understand them today, places where criminals are locked up individually, nor was there any particular method thought out for reforming criminals into good citizens. The idea of reform was just about taking off at this time, and a generation later, prisons as we know them would come into existence in Britain. But in 1788, the question for the British authorities was this. If we aren't going to go ahead and hang this person, how can we at least get them off our hands with minimal costs to the British taxpayer? Sending them to colonies to do productive labor was one solution. With America gone, horizons had to be broadened. This is not a complete explanation, because Britain still had Canada, and the possibility of sending the convicts there was indeed discussed. Sending the convicts to an entirely new British colony in West Africa was also under consideration. Geographically, both of these would have been a lot more straightforward. So we have to examine the other reasons for choosing Australia. They are as follows. <laughs> 
first the reprovisioning of ships on the way to China. That perhaps sounds surprising. You may well imagine that a ship sailing to China after passing the Cape of Good Hope would stay relatively close to the Asian coast. But that isn't necessarily the best option when we are talking about sailing ships, which of course depend on the wind. In the southern hemisphere, there are prevailing winds blowing from west to east in the middle latitudes, that is approximately below South Africa and extending right across the south of Australia. Sailing your ship east in these winds is fast, a fact that is going to come up again later in our narrative. So the idea is you can sail directly east after reprovisioning at the Cape, skirt around Australia and then steer northwards to China and be there more quickly than if you'd sailed northeast after rounding the Cape. To make this plan work, you need another location to resupply between the Cape and China. And unfortunately, Britain at this time had no suitable bases on that route. A settlement in New South Wales would be that base of supply for British merchant ships. Another seeming advantage for Britain was access to certain resources. And to understand this, I must now introduce you to Norfolk Island, 877 miles to the east of the Australian mainland, and today an external territory of Australia. The plan was to settle New South Wales and Norfolk Island together. In fact, the British government anticipated Norfolk Island to be the real gem in Britain's new South Sea Empire. Norfolk Island had two things Britain needed. First, flax plants, whose fibres were used to make the sails for ships. Second, tall, straight pine trees that could be used for mainmasts. For a naval power like Britain, these two resources were absolutely vital. If Britain couldn't get hold of these resources, it wouldn't maintain its naval dominance and wouldn't be able to maintain its power and independence. As the situation stood, Britain was importing these resources from the Baltic. Norfolk Island is small and would thus needed a larger colony to help develop it. New South Wales would provide the agricultural land for food and for the flax and the manpower. The two settlements would exist in a symbiotic relationship with each other. As the great Australian historian Geoffrey Blaney put it, Norfolk Island was the plant nursery. Botany Bay was to be the market garden and flax farm. It was also to be the sea base. A further advantage of occupying these territories was preventing these advantages falling to the hands of a rival power, most particularly the French. As we shall see, the French were indeed taking an active interest in the region. At this time, the imperial rivalry between Britain and France was in full swing. And while overall the preceding century had been better for the British Navy, the French had just performed with phenomenal results in the American Revolutionary War. So while with hindsight we might think of Britain as inevitably superior at sea, no one at this time was taking that for granted. The French were good and the British respected them. And that was all the better reason to make sure this strategic location is British and not French. The American Revolution is relevant in two other ways. Consider this quotation from an early proposal for the colonization of New South Wales. To those who are alarmed at the idea of weakening the mother country by opening a channel for emigration, I must answer that it is more profitable that a part of our countrymen should go to a new abode where they may be useful to us than to the American states. And also the following. This country may afford an asylum to those unfortunate American loyalists to whom Great Britain is bound by every tie of honour and gratitude to protect and support, where they may repair their broken fortunes and again enjoy their former domestic felicity. It can be seen how pressing was the outcome of the American Revolution on the minds of British policymakers. Britain, with its rapid population growth, had developed a tradition of emigration, and many of those migrants were lost to the country by migrating to the United States. Well, at the same time, there were loyalists leaving the United States who needed a new home. Could that new home be in the Antipodes? The answer is no. Actually, many of the hopes of the new colony would be disappointed. No Virginian loyalists were going to settle in faraway Australia when Canada is only 600 miles away. 
a majority of British free migrants in the 19th century would still choose the United States over any of Britain's remaining settler colonies. It also turns out the resources available at Norfolk Island weren't all they were cracked up to be. Sails made from Norfolk Island flax were weak. The pines were good, but transporting them was too impractical. As we shall see, even the creation of a prison colony, a place where criminals are kept in confinement and do forced labour, was going to exist only in a very circumspect manner. The man selected to lead this expedition was Captain Arthur Thillip. When the fleet set sail in 1787, he was a man aged 49 with a respectable naval career behind him. He had served in wars against France, most latterly in the American War, and had also spent time on loan from the Royal Navy in Portuguese service fighting the Spanish, where he earned the respect of the Portuguese as a disciplined and conscientious commander. The correspondence between Philip and the British government shows that Philip had given very serious personal thought to the future of the colony. He had definite ideas of the kind of society he hoped to create. How it can be achieved, in particular, was very solicitous for the well-being of the passengers. For example, he pushed hard to make sure suitable supplies were provided to ensure a healthy voyage for sailors, marines, and convicts alike. And this would truly save the lives of hundreds of people, as the death rate would be really low, unlike subsequent fleets commanded by others that would result in enormous casualties. He was particularly concerned that the women passengers be well taken care of and be protected from any kind of insult or harm from the other convicts or the sailors. Indeed, he had given much thought to how the settler population of New South Wales would be propagated. He hoped to encourage marriage between convicts by giving married convicts more time to tend their own private farms. He also considered bringing women from the Pacific Islands to the colony. The fact that he later changed his mind on this and did not bring these women from the Pacific Islands had enormous consequences for the development of Australia and made possible the British populated Australia of later history. In his plans, Philip also decided completely against slavery. It may seem a strange juxtaposition with a penal colony where most of the settlers are convicts, but Philip wanted to create a land, ultimately, of free people. He put it this way, that there can be no slavery in a free land, and consequently, no slaves. African slave labour would not be part of Philip's New South Wales. This is 29 years before the slave trade would be banned throughout the British Empire. Once again, Philip's ideas about the nature of the society he wanted to create would have enormous consequences. Philip wanted peace with the native population that the settlement inevitably must meet and communicate with. He hoped to find allies among the natives, just as British and French imperialists had done so at various times in North America. He also wanted to keep the natives away from contact with the convicts he was bringing, as he feared the convicts would harm the natives, or perhaps the convicts and the natives would conspire together against the established colonial authority. As we shall see, though, he was not able to protect the natives from the settlers, and he was not able to prevent conflict with the natives. As well as keeping the convicts from consorting with the natives, he also hoped to keep free settlers from being corrupted by convicts. In this respect, he would also be disappointed. Free settlers would be few and far between for some generations, and in many cases, many of the convicts would turn out to be too respectably successful to be ignored. One final way in which Philip showed himself to be quite ahead of his time is his desire to restrict the death penalty. He originally hoped that the death penalty could be restricted to only two crimes, and I quote, There are two crimes that would merit death, murder and sodomy. For either of these crimes, I would wish to confine the criminal to an opportunity offered of delivering him as a prisoner to the natives of New Zealand and let them eat him. The dread of this will operate much stronger than the fear of death. Yes, you heard that right. His idea was to send these two varieties of criminal to be eaten in New Zealand. It wasn't going to quite work out that way. Indeed, not all his vision would come true. There would be conflict with the natives. Convicts would be a defining feature of the Australian colonial experience, and they and their descendants would rise high in Australian society. Nonetheless, 
enough of his vision would materialize, so many of his actions would have important and positive consequences, so beneficial his leadership, that it would be reasonable, in my opinion, to consider Arthur Philip the first father of the Australian nation. The six convict ships of the First Fleet embarked at Portsmouth and Plymouth and rendezvoused at the Isle of Wight on the 16th of March. They would have to wait there for two months for additional ships to join them carrying supplies for the voyage to the colony. At this stage, I would like to introduce you to Captain Lieutenant Watkin Tench, a marine officer aboard these vessels. Such was the interest in Britain about the expedition that Watkin Tench was commissioned, along with many other officers in the First Fleet, to record his experiences, and he would do so in two excellent books that remain important sources for the crossing to Australia and the first years of the settlement. On May the 13th, the convict ships were met by Captain Philip, commanding the Sirius, as well as the ships Supply, Hyena, and three supply vessels. The entire fleet then set sail, with the hyena only accompanying them for a certain distance. The entire fleet heading to Australia was 11 ships. The fleet had just over a 1,000 people, including more than 700 convicts, of which 188 were women, and the rest marines, civil servants, sailors, wives, and children. The convicts included many mechanics and farmers who the authorities thought would possess the appropriate skills for establishing the new colony. Watkin Tench describes the mood of the convicts on departure. A very few accepted, their countenances indicated a high degree of satisfaction, though in some the pang of being severed, perhaps forever from their native land, could not be wholly suppressed. In general, marks of distress were more perceptible among the men than the women, for I recollect to have seen none of those affected on the occasion. Three weeks later, the fleet reached Tenerife after passing by the Madeira Islands. In their one week of rest and resupply at Tenerife, the fleet had its first escape attempt, where a convict stole a small boat and attempted to make his way to Gran Canaria, but the sailors were able to retrieve him. On the 10th of June, the British fleet weighed anchor and set sail for its next destination, the Cape Verde Islands. Unfavorable winds made stopping there impractical, and so they continued directly to Rio de Janeiro in Portuguese Brazil, where they arrived on the 7th of August. An easy time in Brazil was facilitated by Arthur Phillips' high standing among the Portuguese. The Portuguese authorities ensured British officers were not cheated with unfair prices in the stores and that the British fleet acquired the fresh provisions it required. On the 4th of September, they left Brazil, this time heading for the Cape of Good Hope. They made the Dutch colony on the 13th of October. This was the last chance to resupply, after which they headed through those great winds, the westerlies, that took them rapidly to Australia. They then passed round Tasmania, not then known to be an island, and steered north. Arthur Philip, aboard the Sirius, arrived at Botany Bay with part of the fleet on the 18th of January, 1788, while the rest of the fleet would arrive two days later. The passage to Australia had cost the lives of one marine and 24 convicts, a very good outcome by the standards of the day, and much better than some of the subsequent fleets to bring convicts to Australia. Botany Bay was meant to be the final destination, and the excitement of the passengers and the crew was great at the prospect of ending their long confinement aboard ship and beginning their new lives on land. Botany Bay is rightly famous in Australian history as the site of Captain Cook's landfall in Australia. His description of the country around the bay as fertile and suitable for settlement was important for the choice of this site for Philip's expedition. So you can imagine the disappointment of Governor Philip when he explored the bay and found it to be very unsuitable. The place was barren and inhospitable in the summer sun. After a brief exploration, Governor Philip decided that Botany Bay would not be the birthplace of the Australian nation, and instead the fleet would move north to Port Jackson and Sydney Cove. Just before setting off for Port Jackson, however, the British had unexpected visitors. What Tench describes his surprise. Judge of my surprise on hearing from a sergeant who ran down almost breathless to the cabin where I was dressing that a ship had been seen off the harbour's mouth. At first, I only laughed, but knowing the man who spoke to me to be of great veracity and hearing him repeat his information, I flew upon deck 
on which I had barely set my foot when the cry of another sail struck my astonished ear. It was the French expedition of two ships commanded by Captain Laperouse. Laperouse was one of the great figures of European maritime history, a man in a similar mold to Captain Cook, a warrior at times, but more renowned for his contribution to exploration and knowledge. They had come to the Pacific by way of the Straits of Magellan, exploring Hawaii, the western coast of North America, the Pacific coast of Siberia, and then sailing down to the South Seas. Captain Laperouse, like Watkin Tench and Governor Philip, was a veteran of the American War. But these were gentlemen soldiers and there was no bad blood. The two countries were at peace and so friendly contact was made between the two expeditions. The French accompanied the British when they moved to Port Jackson and would stay with them there over a month. British and French officers would dine with each other regularly during the time. While the relations were entirely amicable, the appearance of the French was a stark reminder that Britain could not take their strategic isolation in Australia for granted. Concern that the French would emerge from the misty seas and grab up their own piece of the vast continent would remain a constant spur to British expansion throughout the colonial period. As it turns out, the adventures of Captain Laperouse were about to come to a tragic end. Though no one at Port Jackson would have any idea about it until years later. After departing the British, the French sailed north towards the Solomon Islands, where they would disappear from history, never heard from again. It was later confirmed that they had been wrecked, with survivors of the two ships being killed by the locals. Having disembarked at Sydney Cove in Port Jackson, Philip's two biggest priorities were accommodation and food. The intention was that the colony would grow its own food, and in the meantime, it would need to ration its stores very carefully. Inspecting the land around Port Jackson, some settlers would come to curse the name of Captain Cook, who had so extolled the quality of the land, when they found that it was mediocre at best. Matters were made worse by the fact that many of the convicts were townsmen with no experience of agriculture. Very quickly, Philip realised that the colony was in mortal danger. The rationing would have to be strict, and the theft of food would have to be punished severely. You will recall that Philip wished to restrict the death penalty, but only four days into the settlement at Port Jackson, three convicts were found to be stealing significant amounts of food from the meagre stores. An example had to be made. Of the three men, two were reprieved and held in irons on an island as punishment for a stipulated period of time, while the third, Thomas Barrett, was sentenced to death. Barrett was a career criminal who had spent much of his adult life in prison ships, having originally been meant to be exiled to America before that became impossible. He has two special claims to historical significance. A talented metal worker and coin counterfeiter, he was commissioned with producing a medal to commemorate the fleet's arrival at Botany Bay, the Charlotte Medal, named for the ship he came to Australia on. Barrett is thus double honoured as British Australia's first artist and as the subject of its first execution. The poor quality of the soil, the inexperience of the workforce, and the damage to the seeds brought from England because of the long voyage all meant that agriculture was going to be a serious problem. If the people were going to eat, food was going to have to come from outside. These wants could not be readily communicated with England. Indeed, they had no form of regular communication. A second and third fleet bring convicts and supplies had already been scheduled. But as it happens, the second fleet wouldn't arrive for more than two years. Though, of course, they didn't know it would take so long in 1788. Indeed, that uncertainty about the arrival of supplies was part of the danger of their mission. They could never know when assistance would arrive. Philip would have to look to his own devices. He dispatched a significant portion of the convicts to Norfolk Island. Norfolk Island had fruit growing in relative abundance. That would alleviate the wants of the settlers there. Second, in October, he decided to send Captain John Hunter in command of the Sirius to return to the Cape of Good Hope and buy supplies from the Dutch, just as they'd done on the journey across from England. This would be John Hunter's moment to place himself squarely in British naval history. Philip expected that Hunter would return to the Cape in the most logical fashion by retracing their journey back across the Indian Ocean. 
looking at the globe, that seems the obvious way to do it. But Hunter had other ideas. Remember those westerlies, those prevailing winds that can sail a ship eastwards at remarkable speeds as long as they are far south enough? Captain Hunter calculated that he could reach the Cape faster by sailing east and then continuing all the way back to New South Wales, circumnavigating the globe. Despite being a journey 4,000 miles longer, it would nonetheless be faster than sailing against those westerly winds. It would be history's most dramatic and roundabout grocery shopping trip ever. He would return in May 1789, saving the new colony from starvation. While seen as a stopgap measure on the path to a self-sufficient agricultural colony, John Hunter's remarkable voyage would in fact be a sign of things to come. New South Wales would continue to depend on imports. In the decades to come, as trade and imperial connections increased, this would involve food imports from India and China. When one thinks of penal colonies, one tends to think that the main source of social conflict will be between the jailers and the jailed, guard and convict. As a matter of fact, the biggest threat to Philip's authority, and also that of his successors, came not from the convicts, but from the marines who were supposed to be guarding them. The problem was part personal, part social, and no doubt in part because being posted to a penal colony on Mars is a really crap job, with little chance for glory, glamour, booty or comfort. The marines did not want to act as jailers. These proud warriors saw themselves above the menial task of supervising convict labour gangs. Some marine officers would also refuse to engage in any part of the civil administration, such as sitting as a member of the criminal court. No marine officer was more dissatisfied with their lot than their own commander, an overall second-in-command of the colony, Major Robert Ross. Nothing about this expedition pleased him. He described New South Wales thus. I do not scruple to pronounce that in the whole world there is not a worse country than what we have yet seen of this. All that is contiguous to us is so very barren and forbidding that it may in truth be said here nature is reversed. When his men or officers refused to engage in Philip's schemes, refused to do the work necessary of guards in a penal settlement, he supported them against the colony's governor. Ultimately, Philip would be forced to make Major Ross governor of Norfolk Island just as a way of getting rid of him. No doubt that helped, but it didn't change the fundamental problem that the tasks given to the Marines were beneath their dignity, and they either refused to do them or performed them with the least possible enthusiasm. So what's an open-air jail meant to do without walls, without guards and jailers? Naturally, ask the convicts to pick up the slack. New South Wales has been described as a convict republic. Maybe that pushes the point a little too much, as Governor Philip never lost control to the convicts, but certainly he had to depend on and reconcile and appeal to the convicts to make the colony function. If Marines weren't willing to supervise the convicts, then convicts will supervise convicts. Governor Phillips sought out dependable, hard-working convicts and put them in positions of authority over other convicts. This extended far beyond supervising work gangs. They would have to form the police force also, another task the red-coated veterans of the American wars saw as beneath them. But this had a remarkable knock-on effect. Sometimes Marines commit crimes, and the policeman catching them in the act was a convict. This only exacerbated the aforementioned discontent of the Marines. In this struggle for authority, it was the convicts who came out on top. Now, this isn't to say that everything was good for the convicts. Far from it. They were in a strange land and experienced great privation in the early years of the colony. Nonetheless, the reality of a convict's life in Australia was far from what the modern imagination conjures up when hearing the word convict or the term penal colony. Besides the positions of authority given to them by Governor Philip, the convicts had access to members of the opposite sex, very unlike modern prisons. As Australian historian John Hurst put it, the rulers of Britain were happy to hang and flog prisoners, but they thought locking men away from female company for a long period was unnatural and cruel. 
they were encouraged and did marry and form families, with extramarital, non-committal fornication also a prevalent phenomenon, a serious problem in the eyes of respectable officer Watkin Tench. Were these convicts in England, they would have been denied the right to own property, to marry, to engage in civil functions like courts, and yet all these were allowed of the convicts in Australia. They had to be allowed these things, because there was no one else to improve the land, to propagate the race, or to sit in juries. This was a convict society, but not a prison in any sense we would understand today. For all that, no convict was satisfied all of the time, and some of them found their exile to this bizarre land too much. Some did attempt escape. In one farcical case, a group of Irish convicts that came with the Second Fleet, lacking a clear sense of global geography, attempted to walk to China. As you'd expect, this plan was a disaster. Those that didn't die of exposure or were killed by the natives had to return to the colony to avoid starvation. No doubt exile from your homeland is a great punishment in of itself. And with the discomfort and toil of the early years of New South Wales, one can easily imagine why some convicts would choose to try and get away. Still, this was hardly the strict prison discipline of modern imagination. The reports of Captain Cook had led the British to believe that the country was very sparsely populated, but in fact they found there considerably more natives than expected. Governor Philip first met the locals while exploring Botany Bay in a boat. The natives came to the shore, in the words of Watkin Tench, made many uncouth signs and gestures. Uncouth or not, a successful contact was made, some gifts were exchanged, and the natives helped Philip and his party find fresh water. Initial contacts continued in a similar friendly and even jovial frame. Tench notes the amusement of the natives. These people seemed at a loss to know, probably from our want of beards, of what sex we were, which, having understood, they burst into the most immoderate fits of laughter, talking to each other at the same time with such rapidity and vociferation as I had never before heard. Despite the promising start, not long after settling at Port Jackson, communication with the natives all but ceased. Perhaps the natives now realised the British were not visitors, but were permanent settlers, and thus competitors for scarce resources. Very likely, crimes had been committed against the natives by convicts or marines. Philip himself feared as much. You will recall that he intended to keep the convicts completely separate from the natives, but as we've already discussed, the circumstances of the colony made that tight leash impossible to impose. Over the course of the first year, violence and petty warfare between the settlers and the natives steadily increased. Governor Phillips settled on a plan for addressing the situation, kidnapping a native for the purpose of learning their language, thus facilitating communication and finding a path to peaceful cooperation. They first kidnapped a native called Arabanu, who would be with them six months. Unfortunately, they failed to learn much from him about the local culture before he fell victim to that famous scourge of native societies, smallpox. As had happened earlier in the Americas, the arrival of Europeans brought diseases that wreaked havoc on the locals. Later discussions with natives would suggest that around half of the locals died in the pandemic. Arabanu would be among those who died. This put Governor Phillips' plans for intercourse with the native inhabitants back in square one. The original scheme of kidnapping one or more natives had to be repeated, and this time two were captured, named Colaby and Benelong, in November 1789. This time, diplomacy via kidnapping had important, positive, long-term consequences. Colaby would escape three weeks later. Benelong would do so seven months later, but both would maintain long, mostly peaceful, relations with the British. Benelong, in particular, would become a significant figure of the colony's history. Benelong became a beloved figure of many of the British settlers and had a close relationship with Arthur Philip. He was a charismatic young man, a jokester, a skilled warrior, a voracious eater, and an enthusiastic pursuer of women. Through him, much would be learned about the local language and culture, and he would develop an enthusiasm for that British import, rum. Regular communication between the British and the natives from this point never ceased. 
after Benelong escaped from his captivity, he would visit the British and converse without coercion. He and Colaby would act as guides on various expeditions further into the interior. For all the benefits of this new line of communication, the cycle of violence did not cease. In September 1790, Governor Philip went by boat to Manly Cove to meet the natives, among whom was Benelong. Initially, the meeting seemed entirely friendly. Then the British noticed a lone spearman standing about 20 paces apart. Governor Philip attempted to talk to the man. He waved and walked a little towards him. The man suddenly seemed startled by Philip's action. Recognising this, Philip removed the dagger from his belt and threw it to the ground to show the man that he was approaching unarmed. But the native warrior was alarmed by this action and immediately fixed his spear onto his throwing stick, ready to launch into attack. The governor, seeing that his intent was misunderstood, called out in the local language, weary, weary, meaning bad, trying to communicate that his intentions were misunderstood and show that his intentions were entirely friendly. But as Philip spoke, the warrior launched his spear and struck Philip on the right shoulder. The meeting immediately descended into chaos, the British grabbing their leader and carrying him back to the boats while a few spears were harmlessly hurled from different directions. The governor survived his wound, and in the aftermath, he demonstrated a great deal of restraint and humanity. He insisted that the attack must have been the result of misunderstanding, and that no punitive action should be taken. Settlers who did harm to the natives were liable for strict punishment. Stealing from them was punished by flogging, and Philip made a point of bringing natives to watch the punishment take place, though in fact the scene disgusted the locals, such an impersonal form of justice probably being far too removed from their ways. On the 11th of December, 1792, Arthur Philip left New South Wales for medical treatment in England. His Aboriginal friend, Benelong, would go to England with him, Arthur Philip would never see Australia again. He continued in active naval service until 1805 and died in 1814. Benelong would return, though he would find himself living in a strange limbo, no longer fully part of native culture, nor entirely one with settler culture. Watkin Tench had already returned to England in 1791 and would go on to fight in the next great war with revolutionary France. While I have kept this tale of the founding of New South Wales brief, the trends we see here would continue. First, the British government would continue to be key in supporting and developing Australian colonies. Those familiar with the American colonial history will spot the difference. American colonies were largely set up by private enterprise. Australia was a government project from the start, surely one of the most bizarre government projects ever conceived, yet also one of the most successful. It wasn't successful in most of the terms the British government had actually set itself, it didn't produce the resources they had originally wanted, and it wasn't a cheap method of dealing with conflicts, far from it. It cost the British government the then huge sum of £1 million in just 12 years despite reaching a population by that point of only 5,000. But if the measure of successful government policy is the maintenance, or in this case the creation, of a functioning civilised society, then British policy was phenomenally successful. Food would continue to be a challenge, but the British government picked up the bill for imports from India and China while the colony continued to develop. As they had done with Arthur Philip, convicts found themselves able to negotiate from a very favourable position. While convicts were always required to do some work for the government, assigned to them by the government, very quickly a system was developed of paying them to do additional work, and that additional paid labour became an ever-increasing part of their working life. They ended up being paid better and better supplied than workers back in England. As Australian historian John Hurst describes, Australia's diet in its early years was white bread, or damper, tea, sugar, and rum, with the tea, sugar, and rum always imported, and sometimes the wheat. The consumption per head of all these items exceeded that in Britain. The convicts had more chance of regularly enjoying them than the lower orders at home. 
convicts would also continue to take an ever greater roles of responsibility. All manner of professional and skilled roles were fulfilled by them. Convicts were lawyers, convicts were teachers, convicts were doctors. For the first generation of New South Wales, there were no one else available to fulfill these roles. And as a consequence, convicts became, if not respectable, then certainly well to do. These are two remarkable consequences. Australia became a materially successful society and it became a democracy. In the 1870s and 80s, it had the highest living standard in the world, and the colonial legislatures were more democratic than the home country. Now, the escalating violence we saw between the settlers and the natives would continue, and indeed get much worse in the decades to come. An Aboriginal man, Pimmelway, would lead a guerrilla campaign against the British, starting a little before Arthur Phillips left by killing a British hunter. As in other colonial societies, this would ultimately end in disaster for the natives who lost their country. This is a story that has losers as well as winners, and I have no desire to sugarcoat that. History doesn't always give us what we want. It isn't always fair. The story of New South Wales, the birth of Australia, is a story worth telling not because everything that happened was good, an absurd expectation, but because it set in motion the creation of a society that I believe, at least, is admirable in its achievements. Australia is a remarkable country, and the journey to the country we see there today begins at Port Jackson with Arthur Phillip. No doubt other dates are hugely significant. The arrival of Captain Cook at Botany Bay, the creation of the Australian Commonwealth, the fight at Anzac Cove, but none of the other dates can be said to have given birth to a whole new society with a particular and very successful way of life. For that, we must look to January 26th, 1788. Happy Australia Day, and thank you very much for listening. The year was 1817, my age was 23. And when they found me guilty, the justice said to me, We'll give you transportation, but you know what the heart entails. It's seven years of labour on the shores of New South Wales. Three long months I waited on the Thames or Parnival. We're on the road to England, would rant and cry and The crew on fair the sails And we ploughed the deep blue ocean For the shores of New South Wales Upon the boundless ocean Our flight was greater still In our own filth we wallowed there Like pigs among